lot to smile about it. At least one person who grunted and said yes. Well, this is Christ to y'all. We are within a few minutes of finishing up the fourth that class, which means in the spring session, that's halfway home. So if you have your Bibles, please open to the book of Daniel. And I've opened mine to Daniel chapter 5. Hope that works for you. Daniel chapter 5. Okay. Brother Keith, would you lead us in prayer before we start today? Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this day, this beautiful day that You've given us. We're thankful for this opportunity that we have to assemble together to, at this time to, to study another portion of Thy Word, Father, and to increase our knowledge. We're so thankful for the congregation here at Greens Lake Road that makes this opportunity available to us. Oh, we are mindful at this hour of those who are sick. We ask that you might look down in your love and tender mercy, and if it be in accordance with your will, that they might be restored to much wound health. Holy, we pray that you'll be with us now as we go through this hour of service, and on down through the rest of our lives. Forgive us our sins. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's do a 17 second review of Daniel chapters 1 through 4. Chapter 1, we read about the reality that God gave Judah into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. He took a group of Jewish captives. They picked out some of those young Jewish men to train them in the ways of the Babylonians. And there were introduced to Daniel, Mishael, and Night Azariah. Uh, at the end of chapter 1, they were in good favor with the king. In chapter 2, we read that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And who was it that explained that dream? Daniel did. And he saw a great image, and that image uh, was representative of four uh, earthly kingdoms. And then he saw in this dream a stone that came and, and smashed that image, which was a symbol of the kingdom of God, right? Chapter 3, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had an image built out of gold and the charge was forever death, one to bow down and worship it. And one who refused to do that was going to be tossed into what? Fire furnace. And then, of course, uh, Mishael, Hanani, and Azariah, they were tossed into it, but God uh, rescued them from that. And Nebuchadnezzar had some good things to say about their God. And then in chapter 4, we read that Nebuchadnezzar had another dream. And lo and behold, who came in to explain it? Daniel did. He said, you saw this great tree that filled up the earth. And the tree was cut down, but the stump remained. Well, that tree was symbolic of whom? Ganesha. And uh, one of the main thoughts in the explanation was that Nebuchadnezzar needed to learn a lesson. And the lesson that he needed to learn was what? That God rules in the kingdoms. God rules in the kingdoms of men. And he sets them up and brings them down and he gives that authority to whomsoever he desires. Now Nebuchadnezzar was convinced that someone was really special. And who was Nebuchadnezzar ready to pin that special badge on? Yeah. On himself. So he needed to learn that lesson. He was sent out to live among the beast with the wild donkeys and to eat his grass like ox. Well, time got away from us. That was a little more than the 17 second version. But that's where we are. Now then, in chapter 5, we're going to be reading about the fall of a mighty, mighty powerful empire. And what is that empire that comes crashing down that has the record in chapter 5? Babylonia. There's a man named in verse number 1, and it's not Nebuchadnezzar. It's the name Belshazzar. Now, see if I've got this correct. In the book of Daniel, Belshazzar, without a T, is another name for Daniel. 
Have I got that right? No. If you're talking about Daniel, it looks awfully similar to the name Belshazzar, but after the B-E-L, it has T-E, correct? <coughs> Belteshazzar. Well, this Belshazzar, the king, mentioned in verse 1, king of which empire? Babylonians. Name. We've got a notation at the beginning of chapter 5 in our booklet about the chronology. And as much as possible, we try to keep track of chronology. But let's do this. Look in your Bible in chapter 7 and verse number 1. What's the timeline that's given in chapter 7 and verse 1? First year of Belshazzar. First year of Belshazzar. Now look in chapter 8 and verse 1. What's your timeline there? Third year. Third year. Now, I promise this is not a tricky question. Which would have come first? The first year of Belshazzar or the third year? First. And so, what we'll study next week in chapter 7 about Daniel's vision of these beasts that come up out of the sea, that's in the first year. And what we're going to read in chapter 8, where the spotlight is on two of those kingdoms, the Medo-Persians and the Greeks, that's the third year. Now, in general terms, come back to chapter 5, at what point in Belshazzar's life do the events described in chapter 5 transpire? end of his life. How do we know that? Well, well that. chapter 5, verse 1. Belshazzar the king made a great feast. To a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. And as they're drinking that night, drinking themselves into a drunken stupor, something happened. Look down in verse 30, 3 zero of chapter 5. In that night, does the New King James say the same night? The very night was Belshazzar king of the Chaldeans slain. So again, in general terms, what you read in chapter 5 in the life of Belshazzar, when did it take place? Yeah. Very end. So if chapter 7 verse 1 is the first year of his reign, and chapter 8 is the third year of his reign, and chapter 5 is the last day of his reign, What's the order of those three chapters in terms of chronology? Seven, eight, five. Chapter 7, first year. Chapter 3, third year. Chapter 5, last day of his life. You say, well, how does that affect the message that Daniel communicated from the God of heaven? It doesn't change it one week. But it is a reminder that sometimes things are written in the Bible and they're not written chronologically. You say, well, isn't that a problem? It would be a problem. If a Bible writer says, I'm going to write these things in order, and then he doesn't write them in order. But if a writer of a particular book does not make the claim, I'm going to write it in order, then there's no reason to assume in every case that it's in that, specific, that order which we might have in mind. So it is quite simple. So in chapter 5, what's going to transpire? Well, it's going to start out with Belshazzar. Does, does he have any inkling? When he's drinking that wine and putting on this feast, does he have any inkling that his life is soon to be snuffed out? No. No, life's like that, is it? And in some cases, we can see a gradual decline in someone's head. Okay? And there are instances where it gets to the point that the medical professionals advise that we call them hostages. Because the end is approaching based on how this is played out in other cases. And so in some cases we can get a feel that the end of someone's life is approaching. 
according to it. But is it also true that healthy people die? Is it true that young people die? And so we're simply reminded of the uncertainty of life. Now, what's the, what's the thought process for a number of rulers and they're having a feast with a thousand of their lords? What are they thinking they've got the world by the what? By the tail. Well, Valshasher was going to lose his life for that man. Now, if Babylon comes crashing down, who's going to cause that to happen? Well, the God's going to make it happen, right? And we, we've learned from study of Jeremiah at a previous time that that God identifies who is it that's going to bring down the Babylonian Empire? Middle Persia. And we're going to see that same thing here tonight in chapter 5. So you look in verse number one, Bel I'm sorry, verse two. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring some specific vessels. And he said, we want to drink out of those unique vessels. Made out of what? Gold, Gold and silver. No styrofoam cups at this feast, you <laughs> And what about the origin of those silver and gold cups? In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. We, we've talked, we've mentioned, under <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians took a group into captivity and took some vessels. Took a second group into captivity, took some vessels. Took a third group into captivity and took some vessels. And here in this case, they're drinking out of those vessels. Well, historically speaking, the fall of Babylon is dated approximately, I'll do the hard part, B.C. 538. Okay? So somewhere about 50 years after the fall of the Temple of Jerusalem. Now, what would that indicate on the part of the Babylonians that they're, they're willing to use these vessels as, as wine jars? What was that showing on their part? Disrespect for the God of heaven. The thought being that that, that God of the Jews, he, he, there's not really much to him. Okay? Now, in this chapter, in verse number 2, Nebuchadnezzar is described as being whom in relation to Belshazzar? Father. Father. Well, sometimes, biblically speaking, the word father can refer to grandfather, and the word son can refer to... Grandson. Historical indications are that Belshazzar was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar through Nebuchadnezzar's daughter. Okay? So in the process of them drinking, the Bible says in verse 5, in the same hour came fingers of a human hand, right? And, and what, what are those fingers of that human hand doing? Right. Well, that's not uncommon for a human hand to write. Have you written anything tonight? <laughs> Nothing uncommon about that, you know. But what's going on with this human hand? Where's this writing taking place? On a wall. On a wall. <laughs> and what's the king's response? He's terrified. Yeah. He's terrified. He, he, he's literally got his knees doing what? Knocking, Knocking together. together. He's literally got his knees knocking together according to verse 6. Well, his first line of thought is somebody's going to be able to come in here and explain this stuff. And his thought goes to whom? The wise man. Well, first to his own folks, right? The astrologers, Chaldeans, soothsayers, verse number seven. How, how did that work when Nebuchadnezzar had dream number one? It didn't work. Didn't work. How did that work when Nebuchadnezzar had dream number two? It didn't work. Didn't work. How did it work in this case? It didn't work. It didn't work. And so the king, uh, well, the, 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 queen, the, the, the queen has a recommendation. What's her recommendation? Called him. Called him. There's this fellow. There's this Hebrew. And, and there's a man, verse 11, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods in the days of your father. And his name is Light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom 
the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, the father made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and Susa. And she said, hey, call him in. He's been brought in, according to verse 13, out of Jewry, out of Judah, and let him tell you what, what it means. And so Daniel's brought forth, all right? Let's look at the personal message here from the king to Daniel. Verse 16. Now, I've heard of thee, I've heard of you. Thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts or explain enigmas. Now, if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet or purple. What kind of clothing would that be? Royal royal. Fi- yeah, royal, the finest you can have. Also, chain gold, and you'll be the what? Third ruler. Third ruler in the king name. Third, what wonder why not second? That's probably the position Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, uh, Belshazzar held. Yes. Um, we've got some historical notations. Uh, there's not mentioned directly here in the scriptures, but Belshazzar's daddy was Nebuchadnezzar. Look in your booklet on page 23. Page 23. Page 23. And under our second main point, which is verses 5 to 9, subpoint number 3 under that. The king made a promise to give great honor and authority to one who can read and interpret the message written on the wall. And then repeated that to them. He would make such a person third ruler in the kingdom. Why third? Well, number one was Nebuchadnezzar's Nab- father, and Belshazzar. Was second. Now, what does that mean, a co regent or to co reign? We use that terminology quite a bit when we speak about some of the kings of Judah or some of the kings of Israel. What does it mean, for instance, when, when a person co reigned with daddy? Well, they were co kings, but guess who's really got the most authority? Daddy did. And that's what you've got here in the case of Belshazzar. He's number two, and Daddy Nabonidus is number one. And so the offer then is to make somebody number three. Let me ask you this. Would, would the Babylonians have felt a sense of security in their city? Oh, yeah. What do we know about how that city was protected. Well, he said they had soldiers. That's true. But they had what we would describe as mammoth walls. I don't think I put it in this booklet. Uh, But I went back and referenced again today. According to Herodotus, who was an ancient historian, the walls of Babylon were 87 feet thick. Okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm a football guy, so 87 feet thick, 29 yards. Okay, 29 yards. And 300 feet tall. That's some pretty tall. That's 100 yards of football field, y'all. 100 yards without the end zone. From goal line to goal line, 100 yards. That's, that's how long the how tall the walls were said to be. Now, now tonight, Brother Jim mentioned the, you know, the building of the pyramids, and you think about the building of the pyramids, you say, wow, that was an incredible accomplishment. Well, the walls of Babylon were really something. And so if there slipped into their mind this thought of we are invincible and undestroyable, well, there's a part of us that we kind of get that, right? And so... Where was ancient Babylon located? About 50 miles south of modern Baghdad, Iraq. So he, he comes, Daniel's brought in, and he makes all these offers. And Daniel says, I'm going to stand my ground, and I'm not agreeing to do anything for you. You can pay me more than that. That's, not, that's a good offer, but I know you got more than that. Is that what Daniel said? 
Now, that Daniel was the appeal to material earthly possessions and prominence, that didn't mean anything to Daniel. Okay. So if Daniel ends up receiving material blessings, that wasn't his motivation. Okay? If the king says, here, I want you to have it, and then Daniel ends up having those material blessings, that's one thing. But Daniel, that's not what he's seeking. Verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let thy gifts be to thyself and give thy rewards to another. And yet I will read the, the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. Verse 18. O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he slew. And whom he would, he kept alive. And whom he would, he set up. And whom he would, he put down. What would we say in human terms about the authority or might of Nebuchadnezzar? He what? He was powerful. As powerful as we might imagine a human being. A human being being. God wanted him to learn that lesson on that. Look at verse number 20. But when his heart was lifted up. Now, we read that language about different individuals in the Bible. In this context, who's being described there in verse 20? Nebuchadnezzar. When his heart was lifted up. And his mind was hardened in or by what? Pride. Pride. He was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. You might remember that statement we read last week in chapter 4 where, where, where Nebuchadnezzar was talking about Babylon. And, and, and we kind of paraphrased it in our language. And, and, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar was kind of saying, what about Babylon? Didn't see something? And you know who's responsible for Babylon being something? Nebuchadnezzar thought, who is, who's the answer? Himself. And so pride is going to lead to him being brought down. Verse 21. He was driven from the sons of men. And his heart was made like the beast. And his dwelling was with the wild asses or donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven. Till he knew the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and whom he appointed over it, whomsoever he will. That, that's a history lesson. Now let's bring it up to modern times, Daniel. Verse 22. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thy heart, though thou knewest all this. In other words, you're just like your papa. You're just like your papa. Verse 23, you've lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven and have brought the vessels of his house before thee. And thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and of gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, what's he not done? Not not so Belshazzar had come up short. Come up short in what sense? <clears throat> not having the right attitude toward the God of heaven that he ought to have. Okay? Is he going to pay the price? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and the consequence for Belshazzar is he's going to lose his life and the kingdom is going to crash. Man. We're getting to that point now where Daniel is going to say, here's, here's what those fingers are writing. Number two, here's what it means. Verse 25. Anybody want to read this? This is some of those fun verses for you, John. And this is the writing that was written. Meeny, meeny, tinkle, you farce this is the interpretation. Meaning, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. In other words, what? You're done. Why? Who says? 
Jā, un tā sieši vēl ir vēl. Tikli to ir sēm. Now are weighed in the balances and aren't found one. So it says, well, well, why is God wanting to pick on Belshazzar? God's not picking on Belshazzar. God, with the eyes of justice, has weighed the attitude and actions of Belshazzar, and Belshazzar didn't what? Didn't pass the test. And God, in his infinite wisdom and justice, decided now is the time for Babylon to come down. Because remember, God had said Babylon was going to rule in the Middle East for how long? Seven years. Not 770, that's exactly right. 48. <clears throat> Peter is. Your kingdom is divided and given to, and the identity is given, the needs in Persia. Keep those names in mind. We'll see them in full color in chapter 8. They commanded Belshazzar, and they gave Daniel the blessings of the, the clothes and the chain, and he was made third in the kingdom. Okay? Well, how long is that going to last? <laughs> I never really thought about that too much until going over this lesson again. For how long is Daniel going to be third in the Babylonian Empire? It's a little while. It's a little while because that night is going down. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain, and Darius the Mede, the Mede, took the kingdom about 62 years of age. History indicates that the first emperor of the Medo-Persian Empire was Cyrus. And so the indications are that this fellow uh, Darius was perhaps an administrator. Cyrus appointed person to to take care of activities in the early days uh, after the fall of Babylon. Now, so we've got a transition, y'all, in chapter 5. We're transitioning from the Babylonian Empire to what? Persia. The Persian Empire. True or false? By the power and providence of God, Daniel was elevated to a high position in the Babylonian Empire. Is that true? Yes. yes. That was true under the days of Nebuchadnezzar too, right? True or false, when the Medo-Persians come into power, Daniel, by God's power and providence, is going to be elevated in the Medo-Persian Empire. That's true. Now, let's get a ballpark figure, okay? When the Medo-Persians come to power under Cyrus, how old is Daniel at this point in time? Yeah, you got, got to be right. You know, what we said it back when we looked at chapter 1 that the Babylonians handpicked these young Hebrew males they thought would be suitable for the training that they wanted to give them. And we said at that time, most commonly the estimate is that those young Hebrew boys would have been between the ages of 15 and 20. But they're old enough to demonstrate their intellect and their abilities in certain areas that they're physically fit and so on. So, how do we jump though from that age down to say he's got to be in at least his 80s? How do we get to that point? 70 years, right? The captivity. Now, we know from other passages that Cyrus, when he comes to power of the Middle Persians, He's going to grant the Jews the liberty to do what? Go home. Go home and build the temple. And we read about that. I'm going to do the hard part in chapter 1. Now what book is it? In the Old Testament we we'll read about as uh, uh, Cyrus giving them the opportunity to go home. Well, no, what is it? Ezra. That was not intentional. That's a Monday night at 939. Episode. Okay. So yeah, he's been there for 70 years in captivity. So when you get to chapter 6, if you're ever teaching a class of cookie crunchers or, or white-headed people, if you've got a picture of your, 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 your color and the drawing, or you use a slide, and it's got Daniel too young to shave, he's still a young boy, that's, that's way off. He's not a young boy. Picture, picture somebody you know right now that's 85 or 90 years old and just picture those people 
because of their allegiance to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, they're tossed into a lion's den. That's what happened to me. So why are they messing with lions? Well, if you look at our booklet, chapter 6, the layout, on page 27, the first three verses, the overview there at the top of the page, Daniel's elevated to a high position, right? Well, how do they get to that point where Daniel gets tossed into a lion's den? What's the background to that? Does somebody have their eye out for Daniel? Yes. Who is that? Well, let's, let's drop down, y'all. Look at verse 1 of chapter 6. <coughs> and I know this name, if it's, it's put in the, if it's the modern day country singer, it's Darius. Okay? Or Hooting the Goldfish, it's, it's Darius. But in the Bible, it's more commonly pronounced Darius. Alright? It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes or satraps, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents or governors, and who was the number one? Daniel. Daniel. Okay? So, so Daniel obviously has been put in this position, again, by the providence of God. Daniel's demonstrated things. And the Bible says in verse number 3 that he distinguished himself or was preferred above the others because he had an excellent what? Spirit. This is not about pedigree, y'all. This is not about your DNA or your biological background. But he had an excellent spirit. That reminds me of a, another Israelite in the days of Joshua and Moses. His name was Caleb. The Bible says that Caleb had a different spirit. Numbers 14, verse 24. In comparison to those ten spies who went to the land of Canaan and came back and said, we can't do it, Caleb had a different spirit. So, so Daniel has distinguished himself. He's been recognized by the authorities. He's been put in this prominent place. And then according to verse number 4, those other folks... They had a mission. What was their mission? Bring down Daniel. Find fault in Daniel. You know what? We don't want to fall into that trap of making our point in life, making our high moments and joys in life when we can find fault with another human. Amen. Now, there are times. There are times. When we need to step up and, and point out mistakes that are made. But not because we're on a finding fault with other people mission. Well, these individuals, that was what they're trying to do. Well, how successful were they? They weren't. They weren't able to. And so they came to this conclusion, verse number five, it looks like the only way we're going to get him is what? Set a trap. Set a trap. And use his, what? His spiritual convictions. And maybe we can trip him up in that way. And so they went to Darius, and a decree was written that for 30 days, what? No, no prayers, no request of anybody except him. The king. And what's going to be the punishment? Verse 7, the very end of the verse, let him be cast into the end of last. Now, once a, a law was on the books, as we say, for the Medo Persians, once it's on the books, what? It's it's stayed on the book. Like when you get over in the book of reading in the book of Esther, which is later in history, and it's on the books, the law is written on a certain day the Jews are, you know, they're fair game to be put to death. That was not changing. What they could do is do what? Write an additional law to counteract that, so to speak. But once the law is enforced, that's what it's going to be. Well, according to verse number 9, Darius sang it. Verse 10, did Daniel know about it? Yes, he did. 
when Daniel knew the writing was signed, he went to his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So is this a new habit for Daniel? No, it's nothing. He's praying three times a day. Well, what's this deal about opening your windows toward Jerusalem? It's common practice. Now, that, that was a common practice among the Jews. When Solomon was involved in dedicating the temple with the Israelites, he prayed a prayer. It's one of the longest prayers recorded in the Bible. In that prayer, he said, If your people are far away from here and they turn toward Jerusalem and pray, he said, Please hear their prayer. So it was a common practice. Hold your place there. Look at your Bible in Psalm 55. He said, Brother Ken, well, I got up early this morning to write out the answers to my questions. Do you mean you're not going to ask? We're going to get there. Again. I know some of y'all stayed up late and some of you got up early. And some of you skipped supper tonight so you get those questions done. Right? The teacher's not always right, I guess. Chapter 55, I'm sorry, Psalm 55, verse 17. <clears throat> Evening and morning. And at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. That's the song. It's not a command. It's simply recognition, acknowledgement of what transpired in his life. And you say, well, that's interesting the way he said that, because most of us Americanos, we would say morning, noon, and night. Wonder why he started in the night. In the evening, perhaps, perhaps, from the way they counted their days, right? Their days would start with going down to the sun. So that's the only part of their day. Okay? So what I'm saying is, Daniel having this habit of praying three times a day, he, he wasn't the only one who would be of that man seat. And so the word got to the king. And how happy was the king that Daniel was going to get tossed to the lions? Why, why not? He liked, it. he liked it. Respect for the guy. You see in verse 14, then the king, when he heard these words, that is what was going on with Daniel, because the word was, hey king, there's this Jewish man, and he's not doing what you said to do. He didn't have respect for you. So the king's displeased with himself. Why would he be displeased with himself? He's the one to sign the law. He's the one to sign the law. But no going back on it. Because the law of the Medes and Persians can't be changed. So he's, it says in verse 14, he's till the sun's going down, it looks like he's trying to come up with what? A way to get Daniel. A way to keep, <laughs> keep Daniel from going through this. Okay? Verse 16. The king commanded, they brought Daniel, and cast him into the den of lions. And the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest, have continue. He will deliver. That's an acknowledgement. Again, you don't get the impression that Daniel's trying to impress people. But Daniel just, in Jesus' language, being the salt of the earth and light of the world day in and day out, what do people recognize about him? He serves the God of heaven. He does it continually. And I didn't use that word formally, but I think it's maybe in the book or somewhere. When those other people could not find fault in Daniel, that's what the Bible in the New Testament calls blameless. Not faultless. But if a person is blameless, there's nothing in their life that's unresolved that needs to be resolved. There's, there's nothing on their part that they left undone that they need to be doing. They're not perfect. But Daniel was a blameless person. So the king goes to the palace. The next morning he comes back and, and guess who's there to greet him? Daniel, verse 20. And when he came to the den, he, Darius, cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel, 
And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is that God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? What's your answer? O king, live forever. Yes, king, live forever. That's right, here I am. <clears throat> what was that other case in the book of Daniel prior to this where God delivered faithful servants out of danger? Yeah, the three shall have me shaking the bed go right. And what about their their physical body and the stench and all of that? You wouldn't have known they'd been in the fire unless you'd known they'd been in the fire, right? So Daniel gets out, as we say, unscathed, untouched by the lions. Did anybody lose their life in the lions' did? Yeah. Who did? Those guys who tried to railroad right and get him in prison, right? Put put it put it back. So what's that show you about those lions? Were they real lions? Yeah. So what? How do you explain then that Daniel wasn't harmed? God protected. God protected. Okay. God protected him from that happening. Well. Nebuchadnezzar has some great things to say about God, right? What about Darius? He does too. Look in verse 25. Then King Darius wrote unto all the people, Nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. And his dominion shall be even in the end. He delivered and rescued. He worked his signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. And hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. And so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So a, a lot of good things were said about Daniel's God, but again, I don't think we should conclude from that that Darius is ready to be a servant of Jehovah and no one else. Now, who are those two other individuals in Old Testament history, God's children, who were in a foreign land who were raised up to a prominent position in the government? Who were the other two besides Daniel? Joseph. Joseph, Joseph in Egypt. And the other? Esther. 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 Yeah, Moses had a problem placing in, in, the, in the sense that he was Pharaoh's daughter, you know, raised up. But yeah, Esther and, and Joseph and Daniel. Okay? So, so what do you see in this chapter about Daniel that resonates with us? What is there about Daniel that says, hey, for a young person or for a middle-aged or for an old-timer like me, here's something in Daniel's life that's worthy of imitation. What would you say? Serving God. Okay. What does a servant of God do? He serves God. He doesn't just think about serving God. He doesn't just pray about serving God. He just didn't talk about serving God. He doesn't just spend time around people that serve God. He does what? He serves God. What's the second thing about Daniel? Did I hear another answer right there? What else do you appreciate besides that? Courage. Courage. Trust in God. Trust in God. You know, it's that same thing we saw back in chapter 3 in principle. Here's what a human <coughs> decree says. Here's a law made by humans. And here's the expectation from the God of heaven. And so those men in the face of not of needing to abandon it, but in the face of that being their last day of life. What choice did they make? Yeah. God. Yeah. Again, not to make a name for themselves and not to be in the king's face just because that's who they were. We may not face a fiery furnace like they faced or a lion's den like Daniel faced. We'll face challenges. And we'll face pressure. We may face ultimatums where our jobs were threatened. 
where friendships were friends. And we can learn from these men. It doesn't mean we can't die. It doesn't mean we can't be fired. It doesn't mean we can't be unfriended. Oh, wouldn't that be a terrible old fashion when I was unfriended? <laughs> Let's take a look at some answers to the questions. Then we'll start in chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6. Which one? Five. Five. All right, Brother William, I appreciate it. Brother William, next week we can let you leave two seconds early. Yeah. Chapter 5, here we go, page 26. Who attended Belshazzar's drunken feast? Do not put, not me. Thousand Lord. Thousand Lord. Yeah. Number two. Out of what vessels did they drink during the feast? Gold and silver was brought from what place? The temple. All right. Why, number three, why did Belshazzar's knees knock each other? Terrified by the man's fingers right on the wall, correct? And that's before he knew what it meant, right? He was knee knocking before he even knew what it meant. Number four, who was unable to read that Latin? The wise, the wise men, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. Who had a good idea about asking Daniel's help, number five? The queen. King's wife. King's wife. What earthly rewards, number six, did Belshazzar promise? Uh, Clothes, jewelry, and uh, third, third, third place, right? I don't mean third place like a bronze medal. I mean third ruler in the kingdom. I, I didn't really say that. To me. Number seven. Well, what was Daniel's response to that offer? I'm not interested. Not interested. Number eight. What did Daniel remind Belshazzar about how God had dealt with Nebuchadnezzar? God had given him a what? Kingdom, majesty, all that. When he was lifted up with what? He lost his throne. Pride. And. God wanted him to learn that the Most High does what? Rules in the kingdom of men. Number nine, what sins did Daniel accuse Belshazzar, Belshazzar of committing? His heart, he didn't humble himself, right? He praised the what? The dumb idols. Yeah, the, the lifeless materials. And number three, he failed to glorify whom? God. God. Okay. So there was open idolatry, there was manifested pride, and failure to serve the God of heaven. Number 10, here's a takeaway we didn't mention. For each of us, our life and breath are in whose hands? God's hands. And then finally, what was the basic meaning of the words on the wall? When you say, which wall? That wall. You know, you're going down. You're going down. You're going down. To whom? Means in person. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to put the pause button here. Next week, we, we've given ourselves the task of covering chapter 7. Okay? So what we'll try to do is we'll try to catch up those questions from chapter 6 and then deal with chapter 7. And chapter 7 is going to sound awfully familiar what we had in chapter 2. Because you're going to have this return of the idea of how many kingdoms, how many earthly kingdoms. Listen, y'all, have really enjoyed the class. Be safe out there. There's a bunch of nights. And I look forward to seeing you soon. God willing.